This is the Linux audit framework. I'm Gary Smith. I work at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Richland, Washington, over on the dry side of the state. Um, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory is a Department of Energy lab. We do lots of things that actually aren't related to energy. We do a lot of things with aerosol chemistry. We do a lot of things with biological research. We do a lot of things with uh, diffusion. Here are some pictures of our happy researchers doing science for the public good. Um, let's see if this works. Yes. Okay. I do cybersecurity for the supercomputer and all of its infrastructure there at uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So I like to provide a little bit of context about cybersecurity to start off with. Cybersecurity is all about the management of risk. There are lots of books that will teach you how to think about risk in terms of cybersecurity. I like to think about cybersecurity through what I call the five golden principles of security. If you go out on the web, you will find these located in lots of different places. The only thing I take credit for is arranging them in this particular order because it makes them easier for me to remember. No is at the top and the bottom. Numbers two and four both start with P, and the central concept is in the, is in the middle. Know your system. Know what runs on your system. Know what your protocols look like. Know what your traffic looks like. Know how your loading works. Principle of least privilege. Don't give users, uh, managers, CIOs, CEOs, processes, anything more privilege than they absolutely need to do their job. Defense in depth. That's the central concept. It's number three. Layer your security. Don't just do one thing. Don't just put up a firewall and say, okay, I'm secure. Layer your, your security around in multiple layers like rings around a tree. Protection is key, but detection is a must. You can harden your systems. You can apply patches. You can uh, keep all your updates going. But if you don't know that something has gone wrong, you've lost the ballgame. Last one, know your enemy. Learn your, how your enemy is likely going to attack you. Learn to use his tools. Learn his techniques. Apply them before he gets the chance to learn your own vulnerabilities. This is right out of The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Today, we are doing this one. Protection is key, but detection is a must. The Linux audit framework. It doesn't protect anything. It just lets you know that things have gone wrong, things that are of interest to you. As a result, I can guarantee you of implementing things with, the, with auditing and getting uh, messages about what is happening on your system, I guarantee you, you will learn and know more about your system than you probably thought you ever wanted to know. You will learn how badly written some of your software actually is. And this is all part of defense in depth, just something else to keep you knowing to apply to uh, enhance the overall security. Um, it makes your system more secure by letting you know what's happening in great detail. Um, it doesn't provide extra security. It doesn't protect you from things like SE Linux would or um, uh, any kind of uh, real protection. Uh, it lets you know about malfunctions. It lets you know about different kinds of exploits. It is a tracking mechanism. Um, it gives you extra security. Um, it has several components that are all part of its framework. And it has a kernel module to intercept the system calls. Um, the audit daemon is what you actually see running when you do a ps-ef or some other utility. That actually takes the messages from the kernel and writes them to the disk, and it does some other things. And there are some command line utilities for um, controlling the audit daemon, setting it up, doing archiving. Um, one of the things that it allows you to do that is very useful is it allows you to associate a process with a user. 
This is frequently very hard to do, but it allows you to do that. Uh, it maps processes to the user ID that it started with. We'll talk a little bit more about that. This makes it possible for the system administrator to track the actions of a user and uh, be able to see what they were doing. Um, part of it is creating this audit trail. The audit tools allow you to see uh, and create reports on incidents. You can review particular incidents and you can filter on lots of different things. Some of the things that you can filter on, you can look at things by user, you can look at things by the group, you can look at things by this audit ID. Oops, what's that? What's, what's audit ID? Audit ID is something really unique because whenever a process, whenever you, let's say you log in, you log in, Linux creates for you an audit ID and that audit ID is preserved throughout your entire login session. So you can go back and say, okay, I know that this something happened uh, with this particular audit ID. Let me go back and look at all the things, sequence of operations that ha are associated with this audit ID. That's preserved regardless of, uh, of what you do. Uh, remote host name, you log in from remote host, yeah, that's, you can capture on that information, remote address. System call, there are a, <laughs> a lot of system calls in Linux. You can track by system call, or you can track by the system call arguments. I haven't really found a lot of use for that. Um, file, file operations, and session. The session, what's this session thing? Um, when you log in or you create a top level process in the process tree, a session ID gets assigned to that top process. And that session ID is maintained throughout the whole time that is going on. So if you know that a particular user had a particular session ID, you can track all their actions through the session ID as well. And you can filter on success or failure just like you would expect. Um, for a selective audit, you can filter on the items of interest. Uh, you create your own set of rules uh, for things that may be of interest to you. We'll talk about that. And one of the really nice things about audit is that there are several mechanisms that it has for preserving the data so that you don't lose events. Time now for a nice graphic. Okay. Um, in this graphic, the straight arrows are the way data flows and the dashed arrows are for, are for control. Inside the kernel, there is a specific audit module that handles the rules um, that you write to control the auditing process. That passes information to Audit D, user level process. Audit D writes records out to the audit.log. It takes its marching orders from auditd.conf. That tells it some basic startup information. Once it's started, the audit control program reads your rules file gives a little bit of information to the audit D process, but the main thing it does is it takes those rules of what you're interested in auditing and tells the audit module about that. So, an application does a, an open call and you're interested in open syscalls. So the application tells the kernel, open this file. Well, the kernel passes that information to the audit module that this process is trying to open this particular file. Audit D records that to the audit log, and if you set it up, it also passes it to the audit dispatch daemon. That's kind of a secondary daemon that has a very well-defined plug-in interface, so you can write plugins to do things with additional information that Audit D is passing off. Once you've got things in your audit log, 
two programs, Audit Report, AU Report, and AU Search, allow you to pull information out of the audit log and create reports. Um, there's another program called AU Trace. Um, people here familiar with P Trace and S Trace? Okay. AU Trace is analogous to P Trace and S Trace, but it's for audit events. Um, I haven't found a whole lot of utility for it, but uh, it's there if you're interested. So that's the basic thing. Um, AU Disp, as I mentioned, has a very well defined interface that you can write plugins for. Um, one of the uh, supplied plugins allows you to do remote logging of your audit logs to uh, a centralized server if you so desire. Um, there's also a, all of these programs revolve around a common library of uh, AU parsing to parse the audit events. And we'll talk more about those particular events. Okay. Um, before you can start using audit, you've got to do some setup. Um, installing audit is pretty easy. Yum install audit. Or uh, at get install audit. Not, not too big there, but the, the big deal is doing the configuration. Um, I was a glutton for punishment in high school, and obviously I'm a glutton for punishment by doing uh, two presentations here. But uh, I took three years of Latin in high school, so I have to show off some of my Latin. Um, Julius Caesar said, Gallia est omnis divisa in trace parties, which isn't really correct Latin, but when you're Julius Caesar, it doesn't matter. You can do what you like. <laughs> More or less meaning that Gaul is divided into three parts. Well, the configuration for Audit D is also divided into three parts. There's the Audit Demon itself configuration, there's the Audit Rules, and then if you're using it, the Audit D Demon, and I had to cut something out, so we're not going to talk about that. Wish we did. Okay, the file Etsy audit audit .conf is where audit D gets its marching orders from. Uh, it has uh, a bunch of default settings that come with it, and usually those work. I haven't found too much reason to modify them. Um, let's take a quick look at what goes into it. There's the log file, that's where you're going to send the uh, information that audit D is going to log. There's Two choices for format. There's raw, and if you think the other one might be cooked, well, you're not right. The other one is no log, which says I don't want to log anything. Uh, log group, that's the group that's going to own the file. Priority boost is from zero to four to give the audit D daemon a little extra boost so that it does its stuff. Incremental says I'm going to flush uh, every 20 seconds. Num logs is the number of um, logs that I want to have, so I'm going to keep five logs. Um, if I have, if I want to use an audit D dispatcher, the audit D daemon, uh, this is where I specify it. I don't have to use that at all, or I can write my own. There's a well-defined procedure if you want to write your own um, uh, secondary audit daemon. This um, this QoS, that's quality of service. Uh, this means that I don't really care too much if the Audisp daemon misses a few, which is usually the case. Um, name format is none. Um, if you don't really care about having your, your, your Audisp D logs centralized, uh, you can keep it on each machine that you've got audit running on, but if you want to have it centralized to a centralized server, um, if you fill in this with the host name, it'll append the host name as part of the record so that you can keep it straight by which one, um, uh, which host it actually came from. This is the maximum size that a audit D log can be. So if you take six and multiply it by five, I will have 30 megabytes worth of uh, log files. When a log file reaches the maximum size, it rotates it off and it does this automatically. Um, space left. 
this is a this is the number of megabytes that considers a, a threshold and when it reaches 75 megabytes of space left on the logging device it will send something to syslog and it will mail it to root if it gets down to 50 well I'm going to suspend the audit D operation uh, there's other possibilities there where you can say panic in other words things have gotten so bad I don't want to I don't want to run the, the risk of having things continue on the system and I want it to uh, I want the system to go down um, same for disk full just to spend okay we basically told uh, audit what we want it to do how we want it to operate where we want it to log how many logs we want to keep what the disposition of the logs are things like that now we need to tell it what are we interested in auditing? What kind of events are of interest to us? There are three basic types of audit rules. Well, one of them is a little bit more of configuration. But then we can do watches on file and directories. We can also audit syscalls with uh, incredible precision. Um, unfortunately, um, audit does not come with a default set of rules. Uh, it comes with a pretty much blank set of uh, uh, audit file of uh, configuration, but no real audit rules. Um, the reason being the guys who <coughs> developed audit thought, well, we have absolutely no idea what people are interested in, so rather than <coughs> confuse the issue, we'll let them figure it out. So. Um, first thing you need to consider when you're setting up your rule set is uh, what are you really interested in doing um, and I'll get to that later um, another little caveat is is that if you do an extensive amount of auditing you may suffer a performance problem and most importantly, and I have to remind myself this every now and then, is that when you have audit rules, first match wins. So you can get rule shadowing. So if you have a bunch of rules, the first match is the one that wins. That's the one that uh, gets logged, and you may end up shadowing rules. So um, make sure that you have plenty of room, because your audit logs can grow potentially very large. Um, audit control is the program that you use to control uh, the audit D process. Um, you can give it individual commands from the command line to uh, insert your rules or the easiest way is just to put it in this file called audit rules in the Etsy audit directory and as part of startup audit control will read those rules tell the kernel about them and give a little bit of information to the um, audit daemon as a result so let's take a look at what the sample configuration file looks like okay this is a real short one capital D says delete all your previous rules always a good thing to do clear things out the B is dash B is the number is for buffers how many buffers do you want to have F is how to handle failures and it's either zero one or two zero says fail silently I don't care I'm not interested in hearing about it one says um, log to syslog. Two says panic. Um, that may be a situation where you have a server that if you if things go bad you don't want it to continue. E is for enabling or disabling logging, uh, the audit logging. Zero says I'm not interested, don't log anything. One says turn audit on. Two is a very interesting parameter. Um, two makes all the rules immutable. Even root on a running system cannot change the rules that have been inloaded into the kernel after 
they've all been set up. So, the only way to change the rules in this case is to change the file and reboot. This can be very useful for a, very, for a system that you want very high security on because even root cannot change the audit rules once this has been placed, put in place with E2. Okay, um, one of the things that you can do with the audit daemon is you can watch the activity of a file or a directory or a bunch of files. Um, a lot of program, there are a lot of programs out there for doing file integrity checking and usually what they do is they do some kind of checksum against the file and you then run the program again and it compares another, there's another checksum and it compares the two and it says okay they are the same or they're not the same and if they're not the same I'm going to let you know about it. So what happens if something in the meantime has happened? You have between the, team, the, the times these two programs run, say it's 24 hours, you know that between 8 o'clock yesterday and 8 o'clock today the file changed, but you don't know who did it or the precise time or the mechanism that they used to do it. Audit watches give you tremendous flexibility on this. Uh, say I'm interested in any changes to my auditd.conf. Uh, let me know if the uh, file is read, executed, it's written, or if there's an attribute, A is attribute change, it would be like permissions or ownership or anything like that. This happens in real time. If this file is, say, written to or the attributes are changed, that record gets immediately written into the audit.log. There is none of this wait for 24 hours and find out who did it and you will find out through the audit records who did it. Um, same for this file, I'm interested in the audit rules. If there's a, uh, if it's, re if it's uh, read, executed, written to, or uh, the attributes change. Um, you know, I just have this up here as an example uh, for a flat file that's not an executable file. The X privilege doesn't really mean anything. Um, the Varlog audit directory. I'm watching that directory. So if a new file appears there, there will be an audit record of, about it. Here's something that's really a bit more useful. It's the password. Um, if, they, if it's read, written, executed, or the attribute changed, let me know about it. If the audit program is run, execute, there's the X, let me know about it. And here's a, a sample system call. Um, usually what it is is it's a combination of two things, uh, and order doesn't really matter. Um, entry and exit for entry into the syscall or exit at the end of the syscall and always and never. And I'll show you an example of where never is useful. Um, entry doesn't really have a whole lot of information in it at the beginning of the entry to the um, syscall like you don't know how it's going, what the uh, conclude, what the success code might be. And um, the audit guys say that entry is going away and we're only going to support exit. Um, always says, always do this. Or never says, don't ever do this. And I'm interested in a system call called UMask. So every time UMask syscall is entered, there will be an audit record for it. Um, okay. um, directory watches don't always give you the same amount of information that a file watch does, but a file watch gives you a great amount of information. Um, if you're interested in a bunch of files, put a watch on each separate file. Um, now, a little gotcha. Path name globbing is not supported. You cannot say Etsy, uh, audit, star, and then something. No, that doesn't work. You've got to use the whole, you've got to use the whole path name. The other gotcha is, is that you can only watch files that currently exist. You cannot watch 
at the possibility of a file name existing. Um, I might be, uh, it might be interesting if you could do that because then audit D would have some kind of uh, um, uh, looking into the future capability. Um, and once Audit D is running and it's watching a particular set of files, uh, if files are created in a particular directory uh, and you want to watch them, you've got to go back and update your rules again. Okay. And... Uh, uh, question. Yes? Could you, if you wanted to watch for a file being created, could you do a directory watch and would that generate uh, a lot? That would generate... That would generate some records, but it, would, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be as much information as if you had the whole path name. Okay, one of the really useful features that I've found for audit is you can assign keys to a particular event. For instance, if I'm interested in watching the Etsy Linux directory, I want to assign this particular key to it. That key gives me the ability to search for events of interest based on that key name inside of um, the uh, inside of the audit log. Okay, you can assign multiple keys to an audit event, like I have here. For instance, if I'm interested in the audit control program being executed, I want to assign privileged. And then I also have another key, a secondary key assigned to it that perhaps tells me a little bit more information about it. Like for instance, this is an IDS event and it's an exec and it's a level of info. And um, if you go back and look at some of my a previous presentation I did on the prelude, uh, this will mean more to you. Okay, um, AU search. <coughs> is the program you can use to filter uh, and get information out based on particular rules. Okay. Um, let's say that we have a, a compliance situation where I want to audit the execution of every program that either has the set GID bit or set UID bit set. In other words, I'm interested in privileged program execution. You can track that with audit, but how do you go about setting that up? Okay. Um, set up a script that runs at boot time that writes some information to uh, a temp file. I just call it temp snarf. And here's the script that does this. Okay, what this does is this, notice the back ticks. That says, execute this first. So it grabs for any of these types of file systems in FS tab and prints out that file system name. Then for I in all of this, whatever that happens to be, do this. It will now use the find command to search through all of those file systems and not descend beyond that file system of type F and perm set UID or perm set GID print it out. Then I do a nice little sort just so that I have things in nice or format. Then I write out what my audit command is going to look like. And this gets into some more interesting stuff. Okay, remember I talked about the audit UID? Audit UID. The audit UID is greater than 500, in other words, it's not a system daemon. And the audit UID is not equal to minus one. Okay, this is kind of a bizarre little thing with, with the audit UIDs. Cron ends up having an audit UID of minus one. So I'm not interested in cron jobs. I'm going to assign a key of privileged and I'm going to assign this 
secondary key of IDS exec high to it. And I will loop through all the file systems and find that are locally mounted and find all the set UID and GID programs. And your mileage may vary depending on what you have installed, but you get something that looks kind of like this. By the way, this is the RHEL 6 version of the watch. Um, so, always on exit, my path is fuser mount. If it is executed, the audit UID is greater than 500. I'm not interested in system demons and I'm not interested in cron. Tack on these particular keys when that event happens. So this way I can build up a file of all my set UID, set GID programs, create the audit records, and then all I have to do is point audit control at that temporary file. Bingo. Audit control, read this. And it stuff slows down into the kernel. And my watches are all set. Now, the tricky thing about audit control. Audit control is not a filter program. That means it doesn't read from standard in or write to standard out. So I can't pipe the output from that script that I had directly into audit control. No. This is a security feature, believe it or not. The reason why it's a security feature is it makes sure that you don't have insecure transfer of that information. Audit control is very picky. Your rules file must be owned by root. I've run into this. I've created the rules file in my home directory. I go to root. I tell audit control, read this set of rules, and it says no, file not owned by root. Has to be owned by root. If you're running SE Linux, it's got to have the right SE Linux context also. But for the most part, if it's owned by root, it's okay. Okay. System calls. This is where you can get into having some real fun and getting some really good information. Um, you can audit any syscall inside of, inside of Linux. Um, you can do all sorts of interesting filtering with your syscalls. You can filter by PID, UID, syscall success, failure, any kind of command argument into the syscall. I haven't really found terribly much use for that. Uh, but there are, are many, many possibilities. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, if you have extremely large sets of auditing rules, you may run out, you may have a performance problem. Also, you may end up using lots of disk space. And as I said before, remember, first match wins. The first rule that matches the condition that you have set up, that's what gets logged. Um, so, let's look at some examples of auditing syscall events. Okay, always on exit, whenever, always meaning all the time, whenever the syscall exits, I'm interested in set time of day. So if somebody does a, um, uh, the date command to set the date, that ends up calling set time of day, syscall. That event gets audited. Um, we have a, a wonderful situation where we now have machines that are 64 bits, but they also will work in 32-bit mode. And consequently, we have syscalls for 64 bits. We have syscalls for 32 bits. They're not the same. If I'm interested in only auditing 64-bit calls, this is how you do it. Specify architecture as B64. If you're interested in the 32-bit calls, B32. If you don't specify, will it pick one by default? Um, if you are on a 32-bit machine, it is by default 32-bit. If you're on a machine that can be either, be either one, you'll get an error message. 
you, if you're on a B64 machine, uh, if you're on a machine that is running in 64-bit mode and you don't tell it, you'll get a nasty message from audit, audit control. Uh, I discovered this the hard way. When we moved from 32-bit machines to 64-bit machines, uh, I moved the audit over to the new 64-bit machine and started it up and went, huh, okay, this isn't going to work. I'm going to have to do some work on this. And um, I've got a handout that you'll find interesting on that. Um, I'm interested in this case in the change mode system call. Um, one of the things that we can do is we can filter on uh, the condition code that comes back as a result of a, of a uh, uh, system call. For instance, I want to know about any CHOWN events that uh, exit with access permission denied. Um, one of the curious things is that for some reason the developers thought that you need to negate the value of the condition code, but don't know why. Um, but anyway, this will create audit of, an audit event for all change ownership that fail with this access code. So right away, we can see the utility of this. If somebody is trying to change the access of the permissions on a file and it fails, we might want to know why. Um, get a little more interesting here. Uh, if a create fails with access and the UID is greater than 500, in other words, if it's not a system process, let me know about the create failing. Um, we can get even fancier with it. We can say, I'm interested in an unlink, which is what delete calls or remove. And I'm interested in any audit UID greater than or equal to 500 or the audit ID not equal to minus one. In other words, I'm not interested in cron jobs. Okay, we could string out a whole bunch of uh, lines like this where we're just doing syscall after syscall after syscall. But we can group them together and kind of uh, use that key feature to um, make more sense out of this. So what I'm interested in in this one is if the syscall is a NIT module, which is what gets called when you download a driver into the kernel. Or if it's a delete module, which is what gets called when you do an RM mod and remove a driver from a kernel. Key is modules and a secondary key of interest. So I'm stringing two syscalls together and saving time. I'm also making it more compact. Here's an interesting one. Always on exit, exec v. What's exec v do? Whenever you start a program off, type in a command, you get a fork, and then you get an exec. Exec runs that program. I'm not interested in anything that's not a system daemon, but the UID is zero. And I put a key on it. What's this going to tell me? This will tell me all the non-system IDs that have issued to root what program they run. So I have a very easy, concise mechanism to track roots activity. Bingo. This could be useful for auditing purposes, proving something happened or something didn't happen. Um, remember I said that this will let you know things about your system that you didn't know before. Case in point. Um, we got an update to uh, a bunch of libraries as part of just yum running. And then all of a sudden this program stopped kept working, but I started getting all of these audit events. And for some reason or the other, the, the libraries had changed, although the program that was using it hadn't changed. And now it was trying to delete one of its initialization files and the protection was all wrong. So I started getting all of these audit events about every five minutes whenever it ran. 
And I thought, oh, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to take uh, the unlink off or do anything with that. I don't want to disable that feature. But what I did is I remembered, oh, I can say never audit this event. So never audit on exit that file that it wants to delete being unlinked or renamed. So with that, I got rid of that all that noise by remembering that, oh, I can never audit an event. It's still happening, and I'm waiting for them to get their software right. But now I don't have a bunch of noise records clogging my, my logs up. So just to be clear, that would be prior to your audit line above that's Um. Uh, above. Yeah, in the file, that never would record the fifth item if you wanted that. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, these are not meant, this is not meant to be a, a whole file. This is just yeah. individual examples. But yes, um, th but that is a good point. Remember, first match wins. So if I had this in the file, uh, this one would catch first. This one would be shadowed by it. So this one would never get executed. So, yes, you'd want to put this one up higher. So, as a rule, would you just put your nethers before your Um Yeah, yeah. Um, the general rule is like with anything, uh, usually anything that has first match wins as, a, as its policy, is that you want to go from specific to general. Okay. Um, Records get stored in var log audit audit.log. That's the standard place. And if you want to see one of these records, what can you do? Well, grep is your friend. So grep for a particular instance and you get something like this. Oh boy. Well, <clears throat> maybe grep is not your friend after all. Um, the reason why grep is not your friend is that an audit event consists usually of multiple records. And those records may be interspersed with other records from other audit events. So, um, plus if you're running SE Linux, you got access violations in there, and it's really hard to sift through. Um, plus you get things like this. Well, this is actually a time of day, um, but it's based on the epoch, starting at January 1, 1970. Um, I have no idea what architecture that is, uh, and here's some kind of encoded stuff. Um, we'll talk about getting, making sense of that a little bit later, but a report that you create really concise, human-readable things, reports. Um, some of your options, summary, failed. Uh, you can specify a start and an end time for your report. And a report understands uh, some nice human-readable types of time. For instance, today, yesterday, now, recent meaning five minutes ago, this week, this month, and this year. So you can say, my start is yesterday, my end is now, and you don't have to worry about looking at your watch and remembering, oh gee, what kind of time format does AU report work with? And you can filter by things like authorization, access vector cache misses, logins by user, by executable, by your syscall. Just to get started, hey, you report day summary. And you get something like this, a very nice, simple little report that tells you when it ran from, what you selected, and various types of information that happened. For instance, uh, you got 347 access vector cache misses, you had 76 syscall fails, uh, the number of events, how many people logged in, um, you can drill down on the information by looking at what exactly failed. Um, and unfortunately, 
A report doesn't make nice things line up, unfortunately. But what I'm interested in is I'm interested in looking at failed logins. So what do I notice? I notice, oh, this IP address through SSH tried to log in as root and it failed. And this is the audit ID out here event. Oh, and they tried root again and then they tried some name and then they tried root again and then they tried a couple of other usernames that failed and then I got an invalid user and then they tried FTP and gee, this is all happening over about a two minute period. What have I captured here? I have captured somebody trying a brute force SSH session on one of my servers. Neat. <laughs> Neat. This is useful for doing intrusion detection. This is just one example. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay. And we are on which one? Okay. All right. Um, a report gives you the possibility of doing all of these, formatting all of these nice reports up and giving you a nice general information. But if you want to get down into the down and dirty and get to the nitty gritty, AU search is what you want to use. Uh, AU search reads your audit logs and um, from here, your general methodology that I like to use is use AU report first and then use AU search to get done into it. For instance, here's an example I have. AU report, I'm interested in syscalls that failed and I get something like this. Oh, this particular time of day, SE module was called, and there's the audit UID. There's the event number and the audit UID. So then I take this audit UID, this event number, say AU search, and the I is very important because I says interpret things for me. Interpret the time of day, interpret the UID, the GID, all this other stuff. And we get this. Remember I said that audit events are usually composed of multiple records and that's why grep is not your friend? Well, here's the actual event. What happened was is that, uh, let's see, where is it in here? Okay, there's the directory name where, somebody, where this was going on and we see that the audit ID was a user named Blotto but the UID was root, so they had SU to root. And we see that the syscall was unlink, so they were trying to delete something and they got a no such file or directory. So one of our system managers, Lotto, was trying to do something in SE Linux and perhaps they should go have a talk with him and find out what he was trying to do because it clearly failed. And there's the key. Actually, on this one I have three keys. So I could have actually searched by, based on this key. But this lets me know that somebody's doing, that somebody tried something and it didn't work for them. Perhaps I need to go have a talk with them. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, you can search based on those keys. So you could search remember the interpret flag, and give it a key. And I would want to do it from five minutes ago, and as it just so happened, Etsy Shadow. Gee, hmm. The uh, home directory that this command was executed from was home Gorgo. And I see that the audit UID was Gorgo, and the UID is Gorgo, so Gorgo is just a plain user. He's not a system user, UID of users. And he's tried to use CP to write over Etsy Shadow. Well, I really need to have a talk with this guy. <laughs> no doubt about it, Gorgo is, is uh, either he's got a bad case of typing or he's trying to do something malicious.
And here's the return code. Success is no, and the exit was per the uh, exit code was permission denied. So, um, these reports that you get, either from audit report or as a result of using AU search, um, they're they're not that they're they're not really that great, but. Um, you can do things with said and awk and pearl and uh, create some more interesting reports. But um, Steve Grubb at Red Hat is Mr. Mr. Audit. He is the head of all the stuff with Audit. And he has written a couple of little scripts that allow you to make some interesting graphs out of your Audit stuff. If you're interested in grabbing them, there, there, that's where you can get them. Uh, a little caveat, they require GNU plot and graph viz to work. So, wow. Let's say I want to look at my events. So what I do is AU report, dash E, dash I, and a summary, and pipe that into the make bar program, and I got a nice bar chart of what my audited events were. And uh, as you can see, this I'm getting a lot of crypto decodes, uh, and it just happens to pretty well match the number of logins. So I'm getting a lot of people logging in, a lot of logging ins happening with, um, with SSH. That's what, that's what this activity shows. Um, if I'm interested in what syscalls are being used a lot, I can do a report, my syscalls interpret, I want a summary, pipe that into MakeBar, and no surprise, open. It's my number one syscall. Rename, set domain name, change permission, ch own, socket options, clone. Pretty neat. Um, the other one is real interesting. Um, it allows me to um, do some charts on success and failure. Um, let's see, what do we want to do? Okay, relationships. Remember I said you can find out a lot about how your system is working through audit. Um, Make graph will show you correspondences between, say, programs and syscalls or users and syscalls. Um, there are lots of combinations, and Make graph has some comments at the beginning. But here's an interesting one. Um, what I'm interested in is syscalls, and I pipe that into awk, and I print out just a particular set of lines put them into sort to uh, get them nice and ordered, unique to just get the ones that are of particular interest to me, and I pipe that into MakeGraph, and it generates me this nice little graph that shows me what programs are using what syscalls. For instance, chmod is using the fchmodat syscall. Domain name program is using set domain. Group convert, uTempter, SSHD, password convert are all using open, but group convert is also using rename and password is using rename. IP tables uses set socket opt, libvertd uses clone, xterm uses chl. Wow. It'd be nice if I could generate some pie charts with this, but it, it doesn't. Uh, managers typically like pie charts because it reminds them of food and they understand food real well. <laughs> um, if I wanted to see a correspondence of successful programs to uh, files, I can do it, do it this way. I can take a report, look for success, get the fields I want out, and pipe that into MakeGraph. And I can see that chmod was used against var log last log, and user bin sshd also had contact with varlog, last log, and btemp. So it's writing the successes, failures in here, successes in here, uh, 
password is using etc. Group convert is using Etsy group and group shadow. Password convert is using Etsy password and Etsy shadow. Actually, how about that? This is going a lot better than I thought. Okay, we won't miss lunch after all. Okay, uh, resources. The audit manual pages um, are very useful. Audit D for the audit daemon, auditd.conf, audit control. Uh, it lets you set things up. AU trace, that's the one that's similar to S trace. AU search gives you fine grained control over your searching. AU report, that gives you the basic general report. If you want to con configure Audit D, the secondary uh, dispatching daemon, um, there's the man page for that. Audisp D has its own um, uh, plugin set. The plugin that I found most useful is one that allows me to log all my audit logs to a centralized server. Um, as I mentioned, Steve Grubb at Red Hat is Mr. Audit. Uh, there's his, in, uh, his URL for uh, finding out about um, Audit, all the things that he does with it, uh, where Audit is going, his direction, um, plus those two programs, Make Bar and Make Graph. Um, knowing what to audit and what not to audit is sometimes a very difficult decision. If you look in user, user share doc audit and then whatever the version number is, um, there are several sample audit.rules files in there. Um, CAP rules, LSP, or LSPP rules, the NISPOM chapter eight rules, and the STIG rules from the Department of Energy. I'm sorry, Department of Defense gives you some idea of what are some useful things that you may want to consider auditing rather than trying to make your own decision. And as an extra value added kind of thing, I have, as Rod Serling would say, submitted for your viewing pleasure, I have a working set of audit rules that I use at my installation. These work. Now, I also have Smith's Guide to Cheat Sheets for Audit Report. <laughs> what you want to do and when you want to do it based on the shift of the day that it is. Uh, what kind of commands are useful and what they will tell you. So. There we are, I have few, if I don't have enough, email me at that URL and I will send you a copy. Questions? Will the slides be posted? Yes, they will. I haven't figured out exactly where, but we're working on that. <laughs> Hopefully they'll be, yes? So you wanted to audit a specific user, um, maybe Scenarios on different uses. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, yes. You can set up uh, audit rules uh, based on UID and GID uh, to trap every anything that they're particularly interested in. You can do that. Um, thank you.